the one who reigns forever still the same praise the name jesus name above all names the one who reigns forever still the same praise the name no other name that's higher Let's pray.
warrior made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. My present circumstances does not dictate how I feel on the inside because I know I have trust, I have confidence in Him who is able to do exceed above, above all I can ask for thee. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb. Hallelujah. Praise God. Feels good in here. Ah, it feels good to come back. Worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Thank you for being with us on a Sunday night. You, you just don't know what make it happen. So if it's your first time in our church, buckle up. You may see somebody run. You may see somebody spin. You may see somebody cry. Somebody may start jumping up and down. Ah, we're just expressing to the King of Kings our gratitude, our love, our adoration to Him. He's worthy. He's worthy of all of our praise. Praise God, praise God, praise God. It's my honor tonight to present to Pastor Lewis, our assistant pastor. Uh, pa pastor Martin's good. He, he does a good job. He, he's our shepherd and he's, he, he leads us along, but every shepherd needs, needs some help. And I couldn't think of a better person to walk hand in hand with Pastor Martin than Brother Lewis. This, this guy has more talents than uh, I even have vocabulary words for. Uh, first time I looked up, my, I heard him on the organ. I'm like, mm, he's tricking us. They're playing something in the back. But come to find out, he can play several musical instruments, sing like his pants is on fire. We know he can preach like his pants is on fire. Uh, extremely knowledgeable in the word. Uh, if, if you have any questions, go to him. He, he, he probably can tell you what year Moses wrote Genesis. I mean, he just studies stuff like that. And I'm just like, he wrote it? <laughs> cool. But uh, it, it, uh, we're, we're blessed. We're blessed with the leadership we have in this church. And, and I don't want to take too much time and, and dampen the spirit. Pastor Lewis, would you come? We thank you. Thank you for your commitment to our church, for your commitment to Pastor Martin. Walk in lockstep. We love you. You have to say a few words. Well, I thank God for his goodness. Amen. And to God be the glory, all of it. And, uh, you know, I'm privileged to serve here, to serve you all, and to serve with our pastor. Amen. Brother Martin is wonderful. You are wonderful. And thank you all for your love and all the kind things that you said. Only about half of that might be partly true. But, but no, thank you all. Thank you, sir. Give him a hand. He deserves it. Give him a hand. Praise God. Praise God. Typically, we just take up the offering and y'all walk around and fellowship. But tonight, as last Sunday night, we're going to have a moment of prayer. Uh, we're going to pray for Sister Bobby. Uh, the pastor and the Martin family are down at um, the medical center. They got her all checked in. Uh, uh, there just comes some anxiety. I don't care if you just got finished walking with Jesus in the morning, hand in hand. You're going to go face something like that. You're going to have a twinge of anxiety. We're going to pray for the entire Martin family. That God would be with them. Uh, we, we know that he can do all things and he can guide the hand of the surgeon and the report can be spectacular and that's what we're believing for we're believing that God would calm the nerves of Sister Martin uh, you, you, if you don't know her she can get wound up a little tight and so we're praying that God, hopefully she's not watching I'm sorry uh, but we're, we're, we're going to pray that God will, will, will calm her nerves, her anxiety, make her feel at peace about this. Uh, the, 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 this is the pillars of our church. 
And uh, so, as as we've heard many times, when one member is is down or suffering, we all should be down and suffering. So we're going to lift up that situation. Other needs that you know of, call them out before the King of Kings. We know that He has all power, and there is nothing that He cannot do. Lord Jesus, we come before you tonight. We thank you for this opportunity to gather in your house with our brothers and sisters. We thank you for the opportunity that we can bring our needs before you. For you said in your word where two or three are gathered together, you're in the midst. And then if any two agree on something that, hey, it's going to take place and you're going to make it happen. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man prevaileth much. And then when we ask, we can expect to receive. I'm asking that you be with the Martin family, be with Sister Bobby, that you would guide the hands of the surgeons, dear God, and that the report could come out even better than expected, that you would calm the, the fears and the anxiety and you would give peace to that situation. The other needs that are represented by individuals standing in your presence tonight, I'm asking that your spirit and your power would move in those situations. And for the rest of this service, God, I'm asking that you would have your way, that the miraculous could take place tonight in this building, that the miracle of salvation could take place in someone's life in this building tonight. And we're going to give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. And Lord Jesus, we ask that you would bless this offering that we're going to bring to you, that you would multiply it for your kingdom and for your service. And we say these things in Jesus' name and the church say amen. Bring your offerings, walk around, introduce yourself to someone, shake their hands, and let's have church. Thank you. 
the name we got baptized in. Amen. That's the name when you went down in the water and they called that name over you. Amen. The blessing of God was put on your life. Amen. When the, when the Israelites, when they got ready to be blessed, 
Moses told Aaron, Aaron, here's how you bless them. You say, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. And, 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 and he said, you shall put my name on the children of Israel and they shall be blessed. Amen. The only place we get that name put, us on, put on us is in that water. Amen. And when you come up out of that water, amen, you've got the name of God put upon you and you are blessed. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God for the name. Amen. Thank God for baptism. Thank God for the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Well, we have an announcement to make tonight. You can be seated except for you two. Amen. I am so pleased uh, to be part of this. But Brother Donovan Morlock and Sister Padilla announced their engagement tonight. Amen. So congratulations, and we are looking forward to their wedding. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I guess I should say the rest of you can stand up. Amen. Be sure and get around and congratulate them after church. Amen. That's a wonderful thing. Amen. The Bible says he that finds a wife finds a good thing. Amen. Sorry, Sister Padilla. It doesn't say the same about the husbands, but, you know, but congratulations, Brother Donovan. <laughs> No, I'm teasing. Amen. Mar marriage is wonderful. Uh, open your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 7, chapter 10. And, uh, and we're going to read verse 17 through 31. It's a long reading, but I don't know about you guys, but I, I kind of like the scripture. I love it. Amen. And that's the living word of God. Amen. The word of God is sharp. Amen. It's better than any two-edged sword for showing us who we really are. Amen. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. And when Jesus, when he, when Jesus was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, the man answered Jesus, and said, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him one thing thou lackest go thy way sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me and the man was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions and Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. They kind of believed the prosperity gospel that, you know, if, if, if you're following after God and you're doing his will, that he just pours out the, the material blessings on you. And so they were amazed. You know, how could, how could this be? But Jesus answereth again. And saith unto him, he emphasized it, children, how hard it is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure. That means they were beyond astonished. They were amazed. And they said among themselves, who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Somebody say, Phew. Thank God. Because if you hadn't figured it out yet, folks, we live in a rich nation. Amen. So what's impossible with men, with God, all things are possible. Thank God for it. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. 
And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath, that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life but many that are first shall be last and the last first amen let's bow our head lord jesus thank you for your goodness thank you for your word lord and we ask father that you would just touch us tonight touch our ears touch our hearts lord God, help, help our hearts to be fertile ground for the word, Lord. Amen. Change us, Lord. God, we're a people in need of a fresh touch, Lord, and a fresh anointing, oh God. Let your will be done in this place, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Jesus... Uh, kind of set the scene of this story. Jesus had been to Caesarea Philippi with his disciples, and it was at Caesarea Philippi where Peter had confessed him to be the Christ. And it was, it was there that Jesus went up to a high mountain and was transfigured before Peter, James, and John. And they got to see behind the veil of flesh. And they saw the brightness of his glory. They saw him in clothes that were whiter than any, uh, launder, uh, uh, than any laundromat could make, to, could make them. And, and they were amazed. And they saw uh, Elijah and Moses talking with him. It was, a, it was a great mountaintop experience. And from there... Jesus travels back through Galilee and to Capernaum, but uh, instead of traveling in the open, the Bible says that he traveled in secret uh, because he knew that his time was coming. He knew that the Jews were seeking to, uh, uh, to have him put to death, and so he traveled in secret. And so uh, he spent some time in Capernaum, and after he left Capernaum, so if you picture a map of Israel. So Caesarea Philippi is way up north. And so he's making his way south through Galilee, uh, through Capernaum, and he comes through Jordan. And then he turns instead of going to Jerusalem and goes uh, east beyond the Jordan River uh, into what is today the country of Jordan. And, and there he spent some time. And at the end of, of the time that he spent there, uh, he was getting ready to go. Mark 10, 17, our opening scripture, it says, when he was gone forth into the way. That means as he was setting out on his journey. Jesus had come from the north all the way uh, across the Jordan River, and the time had come for him to leave. And so as he, set, he, as he begins to set out on this journey, this is, a, this is not just another journey. But folks, this was the beginning of the last steps of his final pilgrimage to Jerusalem. He was heading to Jerusalem to a triumphal entry. He was heading towards Golgotha and a cross, a crown of thorns. That's where he was going. And as he set out on his journey, he had, he had just begun. And here comes this rich young ruler, this man. And... He comes not walking to Jesus, but the Bible says he ran to Jesus. I don't know what urgency propelled him to seek Jesus at that moment. We could speculate on what might it have been, but we know this. He was right to run. You see, Jesus would not pass this way again. This was his last chance to see Jesus, although he didn't know it. And so something in him stirred him up, and as Jesus walks out the door to head to a cross. Here he comes running. I don't know, maybe he had waited. Maybe while Jesus was in that teaching, uh, that town, and he, and he had been teaching and doing uh, what he did, maybe the man had been standing in the, uh, in the back of the church, so to speak. You know, in the background, watching and listening. And as Jesus goes to leave, he realizes that now is his moment. And so he runs to Jesus. And he kneels at Jesus' feet. And he says to the Lord, good teacher, good master, 
What must I do to inherit eternal life? Folks, this, this man was right. He was right to run. Amen. It was a good time to run to Jesus. He was absolutely correct to run. And he assumed the correct posture of humility before Jesus. Amen. If there's anybody who it's right to kneel before, it's Jesus. Amen. He's the one who you should kneel before. Not, any, not anybody on earth. Nobody else. No king. No potentate. But he kneels before Jesus. And he asks the right question what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And you know, Ju Jesus is truly the good teacher. He says, good master, good teacher. What must I do? And Jesus answers him. He says, why are you calling me good? Why do you call me good? Don't you know that there's only one that's good, and that's God? Folks, what Jesus was doing here was not just correcting this young man. Amen. But he was giving the young man a glimpse into his divinity. Amen. Here comes the young man running to the feet of Jesus. Propelled by something in his heart to come to Jesus' feet. He kneels before the feet of Jesus. And he lifts his hands. He says, good master, what good thing must I do? A sincere question from a sincere heart. And Jesus his question to him is, do you really know who I am? Why are you calling me good? Don't you know there's only one that's good and that's God? And Jesus doesn't correct him. He doesn't say, don't call me good. Because if there's anyone that should be called good, it's Jesus. You are Jehovah. He's the I am. He is the king of kings. And he goes on to answer the, young's the young man's question. But in doing so, he also gently exposes the young man's error. You see, the young man's question was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The young man believed that there was something that he needed to do, that he could do to inherit eternal life. Not knowing and not realizing that the only one that could do something was the one who was before him. And he was, uh, talking about Jesus, he was, in fact, on his way to do what needed to be done. And so Jesus begins to walk this young man through the Ten Commandments. But he starts in the reverse order. If you read, uh, which we did, if you, if you read what, uh, what Jesus said, Jesus starts on what's sometimes called the second table. He starts at the end of the commandments. And he says, young man, if you want life, don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't bear a false witness. Don't defraud, which is to covet. Don't take what's not yours. Don't want what's not yours. Honor your father and your mother. These six commandments are wrapped up in one statement, and that is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You remember when Jesus gave the two great commandments, and he said, The second is like unto the first. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is, this is these six commandments. This is how you love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man answers, Teacher, Master, I have done this. This time he doesn't say good master. Maybe the, congr the, the congregation, the conversation uh, is perhaps starting to deteriorate a little bit. But the Bible says that Jesus looked at him. And when Jesus looked at him, he loved him. Amen. That tells us that Jesus recognized the sincerity. Some people would like to say, well, this young man was playing the hypocrite and, and, and all that. But I don't believe that's so. I mean, he may have been mistaken, but I, I believe that he came to Jesus with a sincere heart, with a sincere question. And Jesus gave him a sincere answer. And when the young man looked around and said, well, Lord, I've done that, Jesus looked at him and he loved him. And he said, young man, there's one more thing that you need to do. There's one thing, not that you need to do, he said one thing that you lack. 
Go and sell everything that you have. Get rid of it. Sell it all. Give it to the poor. And you're going to have treasure in heaven. But don't stop there. Then pick up your cross and follow me. Now that statement means a lot more when you think that Jesus had just taken a step outside of a house and was on his way to bear his cross. He tells the young man, pick up your cross and go with me to Jerusalem. Go read Mark chapter 10 and then everything that you see in Mark 10, just remind yourself every time somebody says something, Jesus is on his way to be crucified. Jesus is on his way to Calvary. And all of a sudden, boy, that, that starts meaning a whole lot more because in Mark, also later in that chapter, James and John are saying, hey, can we, can we be on your left hand and your right hand? He's on his way to a cross. You really want to be on his left and his right? And so he tells the young man, pick up your cross and follow me. And of course, the story goes on that the young, the young man goes away grieving. He's grieved in his spirit. He's full of sorrow. You see, he could not let go of the world he had at his feet to trust Jesus. He could not stretch his arms out and embrace Jesus because his arms were too full of the stuff of earth. He ran to Jesus. He asked Jesus. And yet... He missed his opportunity to follow Jesus because Jesus never came that way again. And who knows? Maybe a week later. Maybe it was two weeks later. Maybe the young man even made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Maybe he was there when the crowd cried out, crucify him. And I wonder if his mind went back to Jesus saying, hey, if you want treasure in heaven, pick up your cross and follow me. And the young man probably thought, man, I dodged a bullet there. I'm sure glad I didn't take him at his word. I really, I really escaped a bad fate there. Maybe he congratulated himself on, on walking away. I don't know. But let me tell you, folks, it doesn't change the fact that the young man was right to run to Jesus. Amen. He had an urgent need in his life. There was something in his life, even though he seemingly had everything, there was something in his heart that cried out, something is missing. Amen. That, that time that he had spent in that city listening to Jesus teach, watching the miracles perform, something had stirred up in his life, and maybe he was feeling a little hollowness in, in the pit of his stomach as he realized, maybe I've not got everything that I'm supposed to have. I've been doing what I know how to do. I've been living how I know how to live, but, but I still feel like maybe there's something that I'm lacking. And this man teaches with authority. This man teaches with words, not like the scribes teach. He teaches not like the Pharisees teach. But, but he kind of sounds like someone who, who knows the book backwards and forwards. He did because he wrote it. And he goes and he runs to Jesus. Amen. He, you know, I, I just, I, I, I couldn't get away from that when, when I read that. He didn't just walk to Jesus. He didn't just come up to Jesus after, uh, after a miracle was done or after a lesson had been taught. Amen. There was something that propelled him and he ran. He put forth an effort. There was an urgency. My time is running out. I've got to run. Amen. If, if you read the Gospels, most of the running in the Gospels happens in the book of Mark. The man who was possessed with a legion of devils, we find him running to Jesus. Several times we find the crowds running to Jesus. And while there were lots of people that ran to Jesus, there were not a lot of people who followed Jesus. Folks, there, there's lots of people that that run to Jesus. Come on, folks. They run to him when they're in trouble. Amen. They run to Jesus when they're sick. They run to Jesus when things aren't going well. 
And that's, that's right. We should do that. That's not a criticism. Amen. Folks, we should run to Jesus. Amen. When you're sick, you should run to the cross. Amen. You should run to Jesus. Amen. When things are not right in your life, you should run to Jesus. Get there as fast as you can. Amen. When things aren't going well in your life, amen, that is a good time to run to Jesus. Folks, Jesus had compassion on those who ran to him. Amen. When, when they come running to Jesus, when the demoniac, amen, when, he, when that demon-possessed man, a legion of devils were in him, when he ran to Jesus and fell at his feet, Jesus cast the devils out. When those who were sick ran to Jesus, he healed them of all their diseases. When those who were hungry ran to Jesus, he fed them with fish and loaves. And brothers and sisters, he'll do the same for you. But you can't just run to Jesus when you have a need. You've got to follow Jesus. Come on, we've got to run to Jesus. The young man ran to Jesus. But at the end of the day, when Jesus walked on, the young man went walking the other direction. He ran to Jesus. That was right. But then when Jesus walked on, he lingered behind. Folks, we've got to run to the Lord. Amen. We've got to run to him when we're hurting. We've got to run to him when we've sinned. Amen. We've got to run to him when we need forgiveness. We've got to run to him when we need the Holy Ghost. We've got to run to him when we're sick. Amen. But then we have to follow him. Come on. Some of you are old enough to remember the song, I, I just a closer walk with thee. Grant it, Jesus, is my plea, daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Church, we have to be a congregation of people who are walking with Jesus. Amen. We've got to be a church that follows Jesus. We can't just be a people that run to him when the storm is raging. We can't just be one, one who runs to him, amen, when the sickness and the fever is high. Amen. But when the sun comes out and when the fever breaks and Jesus moves on, we say, thanks, Lord. Thanks for the bread. Thanks for the fish, Lord. Now I'm going to do my own thing. No, sir. But we've got to be a church that follows him. We've got to be a church that grabs a hold of the hem of his garment and says, Lord, where you go, that's where I'm going to go. Where you lay your head, that's where I'm going to lay my head. Lord, where you eat is where I'm going to eat. Where you die is where I'm going to die. And where will you rise again, that's where I'm going to rise again. Lord, I'm following you. Amen. Colossians chapter 2 says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Amen. Folks, you got to walk. You got to walk. The Bible says, amen, it calls this Christian life a race. But let me tell you, sometimes I think it's a, it's a, it's a walking race. Amen. You got to walk with him. Every day that you get up, you got to walk in him. Young people, the gospel that you have been taught. Amen. The messages that you have been taught. The Sunday school lessons that you have received. You need to grab a hold of it and put it in your heart and walk with the Lord. Elders, that goes for you too. Amen. We've got to walk with the Lord. Amen. We've got to let our roots down and say, Lord, I'm walking with you. I'm rooted in the faith, and I'm walking with you. Second John verse 6 says, this is love. You know, Lord, I love you. We sing songs, Lord, I love you. Folks, this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. And this is the commandment that, as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Every day. Every day. We can't be fair weather Christians or foul weather Christians more like. Amen. But we've got to walk through. We've got to walk with him on a daily basis. Lord, I, my prayer every day is, God, I want to walk closer with you, Lord. God, Lord, I, there's another song. Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. The mountain's too high. The valley's too low or wide. 
but it's down on my knees I'm going to learn to stand. Lord, I can't walk without you holding my hand. Do you feel that way? Amen. Is that the song of your heart? Lord, I can't make it through this day if I don't know that you're right beside me, leading me, Lord, so I can put my feet where your feet have gone. Come on, some of you, your dad, some, some of you, your dads may have been hunters, or maybe your mom was a hunter, I don't know. I remember walking through the woods with my dad, and, and, and he said, now look, son, put your feet where I put my feet. Because when we, when we would, you know, you go in through the woods, and it's not all uh, level. I mean, sometimes you're, especially if you go through the big thicket. How many of you have ever been in the big thicket? It is a swamp, man. You know, sometimes you're on top of a hill, but next thing you know, you're down in, the, in, 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 a, in, a, in a valley. They, they call them bagels. And down in the bagel, it's swampy and it's muddy and there's standing water and there's snakes and all kinds of creepy crawlies. And my father said, son, put your feet where my feet are because I'm going to show you the path through this area. I'm going to show you how to get through here without getting your feet all, all nasty and soggy. Folks, that's how it is with our Savior. Amen. We've got to walk with Him. We've got to walk close with Him because he, He's leading the way. He's putting His footsteps on the sure ground. And if we put our feet where His feet go, amen, you're not going to fall. Lord, I want to walk with you. Just a closer walk with you. You know, in Genesis, we read about Enoch. And uh, we've got to have that testimony. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, it says Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Folks, that has to be the testimony of every Christian. Amen. That's got to be the testimony of every member of this church is, Lord, I'm walking with you. My testimony, Lord, is I'm walking with you. My testimony is not how great I am or, 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 or all the, the, the strengths that I have. But, Lord, my testimony is I'm walking with you. And one day, come on, folks, one day, amen, he's going to take you. One day you're going to be changed in the moment, of, in the twinkling of an eye. One day, amen, they're going to look for you. But you're not going to be where you were because you're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. Amen. Come on, are they going to say it? Every member of the Pentecostal church of Atascacita walked with God and they were not because God took them. Oh God, grant it, Lord. Grant it, Lord, every elder, every young person, every child, oh Lord. God, grant, Lord, that we walk with you. He was right to run to Jesus, but he missed the boat when he didn't follow Jesus. Amen. The rich young ruler was right to ask Jesus. He had a need in his soul. He had, a, he had a burning question in his heart that he needed an answer to. And he went to the right source. Jesus was the right one to give him the answer. You know, the Bible is full of people who ask questions of Jesus. They said, who are you? Where do you come from? Aren't you the son of Joseph the carpenter? Where did you get this authority? But they also came with requests. Jesus would say, what do you want me to do for you, Lord, that I could receive my sight? Lord, would you come lay your hand on my daughter? Lord, would you just speak the word and my servant will be healed? Amen. All kinds of folks asked Jesus questions and Jesus answered everyone. But brothers and sisters, asking Jesus and hearing his word is simply not enough. It's just not enough. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. It's not, it's not just a, enough just to stand around and say, Lord, Lord, I have a question. It's not simply enough to come to church on a Sunday and to hear his answer. There's got to be something more. My, uh, my mother dropped off a box at my house. And, uh, and it was a box full of odds and ends and, uh, from, my, from my memo, my grandmother. And uh, my grandmother kept everything. 
And when I say she kept everything, I mean she kept everything. Uh, I, I was privileged in, uh, in, in 2002 to come to the city of Houston. And I wasn't from Houston. I lived in, in Lumberton, in Beaumont. And it was on the 610 loop that I was privileged to get my first ticket. My memo kept the, the certified mail slips and the carbon copy paperwork, and I'm, I'm opening this box going, I don't need this. <laughs> I didn't need that reminder. Oh, it was silly why I got a ticket, too. You know, back then they had lowered the speed limit to 55, and I thought I was being smart. There was somebody who was going 65 in front of me, and I sat back and let them go first and then kind of sped up behind them. Young people, don't ever do this. And, uh, and the, the cop pulled out and pulled them over, and then when I went by, kind of proud of myself, then he pulled back and he pulled me over, and he wrote us both a ticket. Oh, Lord, help us. But you know what was in that box? Something... And uh, I don't even know if mom, if mom realized it was in the box. But my memo, my grandmother, she took notes at church. And she had these little, you know, those little pocket notebooks, you know, about, about yay big. You can fit them in your shirt pocket. She had these notebooks. And every service that she was in, she would write the date. She would write who preached. She would write the title. And she would write the scriptures that he preached from. And maybe a few times she wrote a few notes. But as I flipped through this notebook, there was more, or these notebooks, I was just kind of turning. I was actually kind of looking for the scripture I was planning on preaching because I was kind of curious how my pastor growing up, what his title would have been. And, uh, but as I flipped through, all of a sudden I started finding little notes. So-and-so was baptized tonight. So-and-so got the Holy Ghost tonight. I found my name in there. February 14th, 1993, Jeffrey was baptized. And then on November the 7th, 1993, Jeffrey was filled with the Holy Ghost. But my name wasn't the only one in there. There were a lot of other names, kids that were in my youth group people who I went to church with and it kind of broke my heart because some of those people that I saw this one was baptized in fact the, the other young lady that was baptized with me that night they're not walking in the truth that I know of if I'm not mistaken there, there are those of them that they're not in church today they're, to my knowledge and it hurts because I think, you know what? All these messages that I'm reading the titles of, all these scriptures, Brother Davis preached, Brother Salters preached, Brother Roberts preached, Brother Martin preached, different Brother Martin. And every one of them, those people heard the same preaching I heard. They heard the same call of God that I heard. They felt the same tug that I heard. And yet, they're not here tonight. But some have made, not all, but some have made shipwreck of their faith. Folks, hearing the word is not enough. You can come to the Lord with your questions. You, you can get answers to your questions. But folks, hearing it, how many times... You know, we've got some folks that you've walked with the Lord, a, a, you know, a fair amount of time. And how many of you, you, there's those times that you've got a question in your heart and you get to church and it's like the, the preacher just opens the book and begins to address the exact question that you had. That's called God's answering. God's listening. He's listening to you and he's answering. But it's not just enough to hear. Amen. We've got to listen to Jesus. We've got to obey Jesus. And Jesus answers the young man, right? He says, Lord, what do I have to do? And, and, and then it says, Jesus beholding him loved him. Folks, Jesus loves us. He looks with compassion on the people who come to him. 
And he still looks with compassion on those who come asking questions with sincere hearts. You don't have to know everything to live for God. You don't have to know uh, uh, the, all the intricacies of every mystery in the Word. In fact, I, I, I'd be willing to tell you that you will never learn all the mysteries and the treasures that are in God's Word. So we come to God with our questions and, and thank God He has compassion on us. And He looks on us and He loves us. But are we going to listen to what He is saying? Are we going to do more than just hear the word? Are we going to do more than just hear the answer, but actually do the answer? Obey him. In John chapter 6, verse 60, we read this. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, what Jesus had been saying, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? It's a hard saying, Lord, what you just gave us. And how can we hear that? Folks, Jesus gives an answer, but sometimes the answer is a little tough to hear. He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. But are our ears open and our hearts open to hear it and to obey it? Jesus is the living word of God. Jesus is the answer, but will we obey his word? Young people, you can sit on this pew, and anybody else under the sound of my voice, you can sit on these pews your entire life, and you can still be lost. You know, the book of Hebrews, it was talking about the children of Israel. You know, God, God rescued the children of Israel out of Egypt. He brought them out of Egypt with wonders and signs and a mighty, a mighty, uh, an outstretched arm, mighty works. Jesus brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. Plagues, locusts, and darkness, and all these different things. I mean, he brought these people out of Egypt through the Red Sea. Can you imagine? Put yourself on the bank of the Red Sea as the Egyptian army is coming behind you, and you've been following a cloud, and then the cloud moves through the people to stand between the armies of Egypt and the people of Israel, and you're standing there looking at the water, and then all of a sudden you see your pastor. You see Shepherd Moses. He stands up there and he stretches out his rod. And you wonder, what's that old coot doing? But then the wind starts blowing and, and that sea parts. The water stood up one side, a heap on each side. And the people of Israel began to walk through the bottom of the sea on dry land, a wall of water on either side. Don't you think you could live for God in that kind of a situation? But yet, the scripture says in the book of Hebrews that... Uh, God was not pleased with that generation. And many of them fell in the wilderness. And the word preached did not profit them. Because it was not mixed with faith in their hearts. Amen. We can come to church every Sunday. We can sit through every Bible study. We can sit through Sunday school. And that same word, amen, that is able to wash our souls. Amen. That same word that's able to save us. Amen. If you don't reach out and latch a hold of it and say, I believe that. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to give heed to that. Lord, if that's what your word says, I don't care if I don't understand it. I don't care if it's not popular in the world today. Lord, I'm going to do it. If your word says live holy, then I'm going to live holy. Lord, if your word says that I need to be baptized in Jesus, then I'm going to do it. Come on, we gotta, we, we've got we've to take the word and mix it with faith. This thing is about faith. It's not about understanding. It's not about what you know here. It's about what you believe here. God, your word says it, and I'm going to believe it. Lord, if you say take a step, I may not know what's on the other side of that step. But, Lord, according to your word. Come on, we got to get the spirit of Peter when he said, Lord, if it's you, ask me to get out of the boat. And God said, come on. And so there Peter went. 
Folks, we're getting out of the boat. Amen. We're, we've got to get out of the boat. We've got to trust him. And we've got to be doers of the word. Matthew 7, again, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. In Matthew 12, 50, Jesus is looking at the crowd and he says, Whosoever does the will of my Father in heaven, that's who my brother is. That's who my sister is. And that's who my mother is. Amen. You want to be part of God's family. You've got to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. James chapter 1, he says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Brother Martin was talking about uh, the other night how we need more than religion. Amen. Religion is just coming and, 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 and he was talking about you know, coming to church and just, just sitting on the pew and going through the motions. We can do that every Sunday till Jesus comes again and yet our heart not be right. Folks, we've got to be doers. Amen. We've got to be doers. Amen. Come on, we've got to follow him and then we've got to obey him. Listen and obey. Amen. The sheep hear his voice. He says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Amen. And then what did Psalm, 20 say, uh, Tom, uh, Psalm 23 says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Amen. When you feel the rod of God kind of re-guiding you and the staff of God uh, putting you back into the lane where you're supposed to be walking. Amen. You need to be a good sheep and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. If this is the way you want me to walk in, I'm going to be an obedient sheep, Lord. I'm going to do your will, Lord. You know, Christmas is coming. And how many of you, you've got a friend or a relative, and it just seems like they've got everything. What do you give the person who has everything? I think, you know, I used to tell my memo, my grandmother, uh, that she was the hardest person to buy for. And you know Why? Because she was extremely content. She was content. She did not want anything. She was content. The Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. Oh God, grant me that kind of contentment. She was, con she was hard to buy for because she was content. She didn't want anything. Amen. Somebody who has everything they want is very difficult to buy for. And folks, this, this, this young man who comes to Jesus, he had everything. He had everything. In, in Matthew 19, in Matthew's account of this story, Matthew calls him a, a, a young man. He had youth. Mark, in his account, he said he had great possessions. He had wealth. He was young. He was rich. And Luke, Luke in, his, in his account of the story, calls him a ruler. He had position. He had power. He had authority. Now that's a combination right there, folks. He was rich, he was young, and he was powerful. That's the one that came to Jesus. He had everything. Amen. Folks, the world was at his feet. His world was at his feet. He didn't want for anything. You know, Ecclesiastes 6, there's an interesting scripture. He says, uh, there is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men. A man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desireth. Yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is vanity, and it is an evil disease. You know, there's some people that they work their entire life to accumulate wealth. They, they, they work so hard, amen, to get into the position that they would like to be in on their job. And then just when it seems like they've made it, their candle is extinguished. And like a vapor, they're blown away. And then their children or a nonprofit or someone else gets to enjoy the wealth 
that they had accumulated. Ecclesiastes says it's an evil disease. It's common among men. But, folks, that wasn't the rich young ruler's problem. He had the wealth that many aspire to. He had the position of power and authority that many work for. And he had the youth, the vigor, the strength, and the time to enjoy it. To anybody looking around, we'd say, man, that guy's blessed. He's got it going on. And not only that, but he had a degree of piety. When Jesus told him, he said, keep the commandments. His answer was, I've done this. From my youth, I have observed the commandments. And notice Jesus didn't say, you're a liar. Jesus didn't say, you're telling a story. Jesus said, you lack one thing. You've got everything going for you. You've got position. You've got youth. You're, you're good looking. Some of us, we're losing our youth. <laughs> but he had it. Youth, wealth, power. And he had piety. Anybody who looks at him would say, man, that's somebody I want in my church. I need him to be a tithe payer. I need him to be a volunteer. He can be our youth director. But yet Jesus said, you've got one thing more that you need to give. You, you lack one thing. And that one thing was too much to ask of him. He let his youth, he let his wealth, he let his position stop him from following Jesus. He had the world. And he let it hold him back. When Jesus said, you've got to give that world up to follow me. He said, I'm going to hold that world just a little bit closer. He said, Lord, giving up the world, that's not enough to make me want to follow you. Folks, we've got to make our mind up. And this is the title. The world is not enough. The world is not enough to keep me from following Jesus. I don't care what you offer me. I don't care what you put in front of me. I don't care what I'm occupied with. There is nothing in the world that is enough to make me want to say, you know what? Lord, I've had enough. I, I, you know, thanks God, but no thanks. The world is not enough. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold. I'd rather be true to Him. Amen. The world is not enough. Folks, you can just, you, can, you name it. I don't care what it is. I don't care what you put in front of me. Amen. I would like to, I would like to think that I don't have a price. Amen. I would like to think that there is no price on my faithfulness to Jesus. Yeah. Folks, you got, we, 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 we've got to beware when the devil comes and he starts setting prices. Would you do it for this? Yeah. Would you give it up for this? Yeah. Let's think of green eggs and ham. Would you, could you on a train? Would you, could you in the rain? Yeah. I would not, could not. For all the world, turn back from following Jesus. It's not enough. All the tea in China, all the gold in every gold mine in South Africa, every diamond in the mines. Amen. Every bit. I don't care. You could offer me an oil field in the Middle East. It's not enough. You could offer me the wealth of Europe. It's not enough. You could offer me the presidency of the United States, and I'm telling you, it's not enough. Amen. You could threaten to take things from me, and it's not enough because there is nothing that I have that is worth my walk with God. The world is not enough. Amen. Church, you better beware of busyness. You better beware of the little things, amen, that try to creep in. This young man, this rich young ruler, he, he, he was full of things. 
His arms were full. He ran to Jesus. Thank God he did. He, he asked Jesus. But at the end of the day, when Jesus said, will you lay down what you're carrying and pick up the cross that I'm offering you, he kind of looked at everything that he had in his hands and he says, you know what? I can't lay any of this down. Folks, we've got to beware of the things that are in our arms that would stop us from following the Lord. We've got to beware of excuses. We've got to beware of the deceitfulness of riches. Amen. Watch out for the thorns, church. Mark 4 and 18, in the parable of the sower, Jesus was explaining uh, uh, the, the seed that was sown among thorns. And he says, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word... And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. The rich young ruler, for all the things that he did right, for all the things that he said right, he had a heart that was choked by the thorns. Oh God, I don't want to have a thorny heart. I don't want to have a heart that's choked by thorns, Lord. Amen. That when I want to do something for you, I find that my hands are too full of the stuff of earth that I can't, that I can't do anything for you, Lord. God, I don't want to be so full of the stuff of earth that I can't be used in the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, I don't want to be so full, amen, of the busyness of life, amen, that I can't recognize an opportunity to witness to someone and spread the gospel. Amen. Folks, we, come on church, we've got to lay some things down. You know, we used to talk about getting burdens and getting convictions. I wonder, is that too old-fashioned for the church today? Is it too out of style today? Are we too used uh, uh, to the, uh, if you'll forgive me the term, the charismatic model of serving God? Amen. Is there any, my brother Joel was preaching about the sacrifice. Pastor's been preaching about it. Amen. Are, are we too busy? Are we too full of the stuff of earth? Amen. That we can't find a place and say, God, Lord, whatever you want me to lay down, God, I'm willing to lay it down because the world's not enough, Lord. God, whatever you want me to do, if I have to leave my, my life behind, God, if I have to sacrifice my life on the altar of your service, God, Lord, then I'll sacrifice it. Then I'll do whatever because, Lord, the world is not enough. Amen. There's some people, amen, that may need to start a church. Amen. There's some people that God may be calling you to teach a Sunday school school class. There are some people that have got gifts of the Spirit that are dormant in your heart. Amen. That if you would find a place at the altar and start laying some things down, it would make room for God to do a miracle. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, church. I'm talking about conviction. I'm talking about consecration. Hallelujah. Oh, the world is not enough. Amen. I believe pastor has been preaching and I believe that there is a revival for this city. Amen. I believe there is a revival in Atascacita that is just waiting to break forth. Amen. I believe the windows of heaven are swollen with rain. I see the clouds and I feel like the bottom's just about to break out. Amen. But what it needs is some saints who will say, God, I'm laying some things down on your altar tonight that you could move. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hmm. Come on. We got to get rid of the thorns. Amen. We're a wealthy society. And don't, you know, sometimes we say, well, you know, I'm not wealthy. I don't have as much money as Bill Gates. Folks, we're a wealthy society. Amen. We have things that, that people in some parts of the world, they dream of. Amen. That's why so many people want to come here. Amen. Because we are an affluent society. Amen. The poorest among us or many of the poorest among us, amen, are better off. Amen. Than the ri than Come on. We're full of blessings. We're comfortable. And we're sitting among thorns. Mm. 
the prophet Amos, he was a shepherd. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't the son of a prophet. He wasn't a priest. He was just a shepherd. But he heard the voice of God speak to him. Come on, some of you say, well, I'm not a, I'm not a preacher. and I, I, You know, God didn't call me. You, that's fine. Amen. But you can do something in the kingdom of God. I guarantee you God has got something that you need to do in his kingdom. And so Amos answered the call of God. And he began to prophesy against the northern kingdom of Israel. He prophesied judgment against them. And at the time, things were never better. The economy was great. The king had gone out and reconquered a bunch of cities that had been lost. The kingdom, the borders of the kingdom were expanding. The trade was good. There was peace. It was good. And here comes Amos. And Amos was saying, hey, don't seek after, seek, seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as you have spoken. In the midst of a prosperous nation, Amos was sounding a warning bell. Would you seek good and not evil so that you can live? He was looking at the kingdom going, you're dying. There's destruction coming upon you. But if you'll just, if you'll just change your heart, then you can live. And yet they, weren't, they wouldn't listen. They were too comfortable. The church in Laodicea said, hey, we're rich. We're increased in goods. We don't need anything. But God looked at them and said, you're miserable, poor, blind, and naked. But I can give you what you need. Folks, there's a lot of people in our nation. There's a lot of people in this community that they're on, they're on spiritual hospice. Y'all know what hospice is. That's when, that's when the doctors have done all that they can do. The medicine has reached the end of its ability. And they bring in the hospice nurse. And if I'm oversimplifying it, I know we've got some medical people. Please forgive me. And, and you feel free to correct me. But I, I believe, if I understand it correctly, that the goal of the hospice is to make the person comfortable. To make them comfortable. I'm not here to stop you from dying. I'm just here to make it comfortable. I'm here to ease the pain as you slip into the good night. And folks, there's a ton of people in this world in a task of Sita, and pray God not in this church. Amen. That they're on spiritual hospice. Amen. They're just comfortable, happy as a clam, comfortable. Waiting on death to come and take them away. And where's the church? Where are we the church? I hope we're not sitting among the thorns with them. Amen. Folks, we can't, we can't be too comfortable. Folks, this church, this church is not in the business of offering spiritual hospice care to people. Amen. We've, we, we, we know the answer. Amen. We've got the healing that will bring life into someone. Amen. We've got a message called the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. And we've got the proper response to the gospel. Repent, be baptized, and you will receive in the name of Jesus, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that's the spirit of life that will bring you up out of your grave. Oh, man, we, we've got, we have got the cure, folks. Amen. You know, you know, if somebody walked out today with the cure to cancer, man, they'd win the Nobel Prize. They would be celebrated. They would, everyone would flock to them. Folks, we have got the cure. Amen. And his name is Jesus. Amen. And that's the business that this church is in, is spreading the gospel, being busy about the king's business because there's a f bunch of folks that are dying among the thorns. Amen, folks, we can't be comfortable. Don't let us get in the same, the same spirit. Amen, Lord, don't let me, Lord, get so caught up in doing what I've got to do on a day-to-day -day basis, Lord, that I, can't, that I can't shake myself and get up and do something for the kingdom. Come on, folks. It's, it's the nuts and bolts of living for, for Jesus, Right? It's the nuts and bolts of walking with Jesus. Prayer, Bible reading, come to church, witness. 
we got to do it. Right. Hey, Amen. I, I, we have a, those of you may not know, we have a church lockup team. We have some men, and I'm very grateful to them if they're here tonight. Some of them are. Uh, thank, thank, thank you to the lockup team for getting here early in the morning and unlocking the church and making sure the air conditions are on and the, the lights are on and, and, and everything is, is, is ready to go when you get here. I'm thankful for our lockup team. Amen. This morning as I, as I reached here, I got, I got to church. I was on lockup this morning and, uh, and when I got to this door over here, before the door unlocked, right as I got to the door, a rooster started crowing over in that neighborhood. And, and it was, you know, 7 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> and the rooster started crowing. And at the time, I thought, who in the world has roosters in the middle of a neighborhood? Church goes on today. And this evening, I'm coming back, and I'm coming to unlock for evening service and as I get to the door the rooster started crowing again now I I wasn't raised on a farm I don't live on a farm I've been accused of being raised in a barn before but uh, but I was not maybe roosters crow at all hours of the day I, I don't know but I tell you what when the rooster crowed something stirred up in my mind a rooster crowing in the morning, a rooster crowing in the evening. And my mind goes back to the messages that Brother Martin's been preaching and the messages Brother Joel's been preaching and the messages Brother Cecil's been preaching. And, and, and my goodness, I just felt like maybe God is saying, church, wake up, wake up, wake up. When you get to the church door, I'm, I'm letting you hear a little rooster because I'm, I'm wanting you to know that it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up out of your slumber. It's time to put both feet on the floor. Wipe the sleep from your eyes because the time is coming. Amen. The night is coming and no man's going to be able to work. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. Amen. This is the conclusion. Church, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. Amen. Would you hear the voice of God calling? And would you answer? Would you hear the... Amen. Would you hear the call of God and answer it? Follow him. Seek him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, glory, these altars are open. I wonder, is there anyone who wants to make a fresh consecration? Amen. Who just wants to say, Lord, I don't want to be sleeping. Amen. God, I want to be used however you want me to be used. Oh, God. Amen. Church, let's find a place of prayer. Amen. Let's find a place to seek a freshness. Amen. A fresh renewing of the spirit. Amen. If you've been struggling with sin in your life, amen, all you've got to do is say, God, forgive me, Lord. Amen. Forgive me. And you will be forgiven that fast. Amen. There's no sin. Amen. That can stop you from being a part of the work that God is doing. Amen. If you will but repent. Amen. Hallelujah. There's nothing. Amen. That you can't lay down. Amen. And be used in the kingdom of God. Amen. Church, we've got a revival in this city. Hi, this is Pastor Kevin Martin, and I just want to thank you all for joining us today, tuning in and being a part of our service. We hope that it was a blessing to you and that you were uplifted and encouraged and felt the presence of the Lord. If you would like to know more about our church, please join us at www.atascacitaupc.com and you will find all of the ministries. You will find pictures where you could take a journey and see everything that's been going on at the Pentecostal Church of Atascacita. And uh, we hope that you join us again very soon. God bless you.